Okay, so let's try to solve this. Uh, so my classical approximation is about um, solving these uh, equations. So let's see what we get. Well, the first equation is kind of simple. I think everybody has the temptation there to just take the square root, and that's what we should do. S0 prime is equal to plus minus P of x. Um, and therefore, S0 of x is equal to plus minus the integral up to x of p of x prime dx prime. You see, p of x is pretty much known. We, if you know the energy of your particle, then it's, it's completely known. Um, and uh, it depends on e minus v. So this is a, a solution in terms of p of x. We should think of solving the differential equation in terms of p of x. Now, as a first order differential equation, there's a constant of integration. And we'll pick it up to be a number here, x0. So we start integrating from some place. If you integrate from another place, you're shifting the constant of integration. The main thing is that the x derivative here uh, acts on the upper limit and gives you the p of x of that equation. So this is our solution. Even the plus minus should not disturb us. Uh, if you have the p squared, you don't know if the particle is moving to the left or to the right. So that ambiguity is perfectly reasonable. Oh, particle can be moving to the left or to the right. Now we look at the second equation. So S1 prime is equal to I over 2. S0 double prime. If you have S0 double prime, you have here S0 prime. So you take another derivative. So that's plus minus P prime of x divided by S0 prime, which is plus minus P of x. That's kind of nice. The sign is going to cancel. So we have here i over 2, p prime of x over p of x, or i over 2, logarithm of p, p of x, prime. The derivative of the logarithm is 1 over the function. And then by chain rule, you get the p prime there. So if S1, the prime derivative, is the derivative of this thing, so S1 is going to be i over 2 log of p of x plus a constant. So let's reconstruct our solution. That's not hard. We wrote the ansatz up there. So the wave function is e to the i over h bar times s. And s is what we had there. So our wave function is uh, e to the i over h bar s. And s was s0 plus i. Uh, plus h bar is 1. It's, there's more, is that right? But uh, we're going to ignore it. We didn't go that far. In fact, nobody goes higher in the WKB approximation. So what do we have here? Um, I'll write it. Uh, this term is kind of interesting. The, we have e to the i h bar s0 of x times e to the i s1. And s1 was 
i over 2 log of p of x plus a constant. So uh, look at this. i times i is minus 1, 2. Um, so uh, you have 1 half. So this becomes e to the minus 1 half logarithm of p of x. And 1 half the logarithm of p of x is e to the minus log of square root of p of x. And uh, when you go like that, e to the minus that is 1 over the function. So p of x, like that. And then we have e to the i over h bar integral from x0 to x, p of x prime dx prime. This is the classic WKB approximation, classic result. So as promised, this is of the form of a scale factor here, a row, a square root of row, times a phase. So we did begin with a pure, what looked like a pure phase, but then we said S of x is complex. In fact, S0 was real, but S1 was imaginary. With S1 imaginary, the role of S1 was to provide the magnitude. And this is a, an intuition on this approximation scheme. That the first thing you have to get right is the phase. Once you get the phase right, the next order, you get the amplitude of the wave right. That comes to second order. That's... Um, a next effect. So this is our solution. Um, when I began today, I reminded you that we have WKB solutions of the form square root of rho e to the i s, and uh, we calculated some things for that. So because of the signs, S0, I dropped the sign. There's plus or minus. Uh, let me write the general solutions. Um, of WKB slightly more complete. Um, let's be more complete. That's, it's important to see the whole freedom here. So if we have E greater than V, remember when E is greater than V, uh, the P of X is a real quantity. And uh, we wrote and we said that P of x, we would write as h bar k of x. Um, you know, I think I should have probably, for convenience here, let's put a constant. Uh, we're not attempting to normalize these wave functions. We could not attempt to do it because we don't know what P of x is. And this function may have limited validity, as we've spoken. But I had the constants here. This constant could have a real or imaginary part. It would affect this A. So let's put it there. OK. So if P of x is HK of x, we can have the following solutions. Psi of x and t equal A, another constant, square root of P Let's go simpler, square root of k. It's a different a. And here, e to the i, since p is h bar, it cancels here. So we have a, a simpler integral as well, x0 to x, k of x prime dx prime. So that's that term. I just replace, use the opportunity to replace p for k, which simplifies your life, simplifies all these concepts. So the other 
solution is the wave moving in a different direction. So k of x e to the minus i x0 to x k of x prime d of x prime. So that is your solution when you have e greater than v. If we have e less than v, we still have a solution. And uh, we said that p of x in that case would be equal to i h bar kappa of x. We use that notation. If e is less than v, this is a negative number, so p of x is i times some positive number, a square root of a positive number, and we called it kappa last time. So it's, this is the letter we usually use for spatial dependence in regions where the wave function decays exponentially, which is what is going to happen here. So what is the psi of x and t? Is equal to a constant c over square root of kappa of x e to the the i will disappear, and there will be two solutions, one with plus, one with minus. That, that's the reason I don't have to be very careful in saying whether this is i or minus i. There's anyway two solutions. At this stage, we don't need to worry. So this is from x0 to x, kappa of x prime dx prime, plus d over square root of kappa of x, e to the minus x0 to x, kappa of x prime dx prime. So this is the complete solution of WKB. If you are in the classically allowed region top or in the classically forbidden region, um, it's important to realize that this function, the second term, is the decaying exponential. As x increases, the integral accumulates more and more value, and the wave function gets more and more suppressed. This is a growing kind of exponential. In, in the previous iteration in your life, kappa was a constant, if you had constant potentials, and this would be e to the kappa x, basically. But here, uh, you must think of kappa being some positive number, uh, positive function. As you integrate and x grows, your cube, the integral becomes bigger, and this is a growing exponential. So the sign tells you that, especially because we've ordered the limits properly. So we have a decaying and growing exponential. Uh, we can, at this moment, we're pretty much done with what WKB um, does for you, although we have a few things still to say. So this will be in terms of uh, comments about the general validity of such um, approximation, but first even some comments about the current and charge density. So let's consider this uh, equation one. Let's just make the comments for, for comments. For equation one on one. What is the charge density or the probability density in this case, rho? would be psi squared, and in case one, is equal to a squared over k of x. You could, if you wish, this is a perfectly nice formula, multiply by h bar up and down, 
And that's the momentum. So it's h bar a squared over p of x. And you could say this is h bar over m, a squared over v of x, a local velocity. p of x is m over a local velocity. And this is an intuition you've had uh, for a long time. The probability density, or the amplitude of the wave, is going to become bigger in the regions where the particle has a smaller velocity. That's the regions of the potential where the particle spends more time. And it's an intuition that almost immediately comes here. This k is essentially the momentum. So that's essentially the square root of the velocity. And this coefficient, therefore, becomes bigger as the velocity is smaller. That's part of the intuition you've had uh, for a long time regarding these uh, quantities. The other piece is the computation of the current from this equation one. Remember, the current is h bar over m times the imaginary part of psi star gradient psi. So it's a long computation. But we did it for the case um, we had before. We said that the current is rho times gradient of s over m for the case when the wave function is written in rho e to the s form. So in here, rho is already determined, is a squared over k of x. We have the 1 over m. And the gradient of s, s is this quantity, e to the i h bar times s. So the gradient of s is just p of x, so h bar k of x. Now, they cancel. And it's very fortunate that they cancel. It would have been a major disaster if they didn't. Um, this is a number. It's a squared over m. The reason it cancels is that uh, it would have failed the conservation law otherwise. d rho dt plus the divergence of j should be 0. In our case, rho has no uh, time dependence. The wave functions that we are considering are time-independent Schrodinger equations we're considering energy eigenstates, and uh, the current must be a constant. In an energy eigenstate, the current cannot be a spatially varying constant, because then the current would accumulate in some place, and that's inconsistent with stationary states. And in fact, this is 0. And the versions of j, in this case, would be dj dx. And uh, if it would have had some x dependence, it would have destroyed this equation. So dj dx is also 0. And that's all consistent. <laughs>